People always say, oh, that it must be just like Christmas opening a kiln. But it's not, really. There's a lot more anxiety because there's so much work that, that goes into each firing, each load of pots. It's a really private, personal time and can be really wonderful, but it can also be really pretty difficult. And I can't even really objectively see the pots for about two weeks. Once you can let your expectations melt away, then you can actually look at the pot and, and see it. They, um, they really reveal themselves very slowly to you. The cold never bothers me. Because I, I grew up in New England. I like the cold. I like a real winter. There are days, certainly, when I wake up out here and I wonder and I question, what motivated me to be out here? And I think that maybe there was a, a small percentage that was running away from something. And there's days when very clearly I feel like I needed to put this space here. Came down to North Carolina to go to college at Guilford in Greensboro. Talked my way into a class with Charlie Teft, who runs the ceramic program. It was there that my eyes were really open to this huge world of clay that exists in North Carolina. There was a potter named Matt Jones, and I started helping Matt fire. The first time I went into his workshop, there was a smell about it, and it has a dirt floor, and it's very dark, and something felt really right about it. I felt I could really put my head down and learn something. The apprenticeship at Matt Jones's was structured in the same way that his apprenticeships were structured. I would do chores like chop wood, mix glazes, mix clay. As long as I had those things taken care of, I could also make pots. All right, Corey, these are little coffee mugs. They're sort of a, a variation of that coal mug that I love from Sanford, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. He would throw a pot. That was the sort of small piece of perfection that I was striving for. I actually think that somewhere in between and the rest of the day, I would look at that pot and I would try to mimic it. And you need to sort of sacrifice your ego. If you can't do that, this type of apprenticeship will prove to be very difficult. Keep it a little wider at okay. the top. It's bigger than just you. You're part of a whole arc. I worked with Matt. Matt worked with Mark Hewitt. Mark Hewitt was with Todd Piker. They were with Michael Cardew in England. Cardew was Bernard Leach's first apprentice. So we're all sort of in it together and pushing each other forward. North Carolina is really a, a land made of clay. It's everywhere. I can remember the first time that I used a local clay and it was a huge amount of work and it's incredibly labor-intensive to refine it and process it. But it threw beautifully, and the color was beautiful, and it had all this character. But the throwing, I struggle with it. I think that's a funny illusion that art is joy, because it's not always joy. And I think a lot of good art comes from struggle. And there's good days and there's bad days.
the way that I throw, it's looking at older pots, especially older pots from North Carolina, and looking at characteristics of those pots. Since most of those pots were made for function, it was important that they were light. And so there are certain things that I really beat myself up about trying to make them as light as possible. But they have to look good sitting a nice mid-century home or a modern home. I and mean, that's the real challenge for me now, I feel, is the pots fit into a broader context of the world, not just be suited for a country cottage. But every once in a while, it's kind of nice to come back to an older form. There's an elegance to a picture that I don't really want to mess with. Instead, it's just a slow refinement of the form. I mean, they had to make a lot of these. They had to be very proficient, but they still added a little bit of themselves into each one. They still had the touch of the maker. The technique that I use to decorate the pots is called slip trailing. And it's an old technique. You can see it all over the world in all different pottery traditions. And it's something I express a little bit of myself in that. And that's certainly what people seem to recognize me for is my slip trailing. Well, I grew up with both my mother and father practicing artists. As long as I can remember, they were in their studios working. That was what I saw. So to be an artist, nobody would raise an eyebrow at it. It was like the doctor's son going to med school. Being up here every day, it turns into a juggling act. Certain ones need to be attended to at certain times, and they need to be decorated, and these need to be glazed, and these need to be trimmed. Watching the racks fill up with pots, it's really fantastic. <laughs> What's your ruin? I erased it, and then oh. I had to try to... Well, all you gotta do is you can just turn this into a leaf, even. But I tried yeah. to do that, and then it looked ridiculous. <laughs> Connie and I met in Madison County at a farmer's market in the bottom of the old roller rink in Mars Hill. And she worked for a goat dairy in northern Madison County. She was selling goat cheese. We spent that first winter driving back and forth on these snowy roads. It was the craziest winter that we'd had in years uh, through two feet of snow. She's watched this go from an old tobacco field to what it is today and been part of that change. She's really hugely important. Our year is broken into cycles, and right now I fired the kiln four times, so that's four different cycles. As I'm making the pots, I sort of have an idea of, in my head, where they're going to go in the kiln. Let's come over towards me just to do oh, that's, that's okay. okay. That's okay. Yeah, it's, it's a puzzle to fit them all in. So, you got one short, I think the short one fat one, yeah. Bring, bring me that one. For the most part, the pots farther back in the kiln have more decoration, more glaze. The farther you are in the front of the kiln, the more ash and salt the pots are going to have on them because the hottest part of the kiln is in the front, so they don't need as much surface decoration. The form is important, but then the form will interact with the ash deposit that the flame will put on them. So that relies on the fire to do all of the work. Well, that's the most intense moment because you've got two or three months of work behind you and you load it into the kiln and then you sort of step back away from it. There's an element of serendipity and chance that you have in that process that doesn't exist in many other artistic processes. I still have control, but there's certainly a lot of things that are happening in the kiln that you don't have control over.
I think in my situation, I had to kind of run away to find myself. So my family history, if we want to talk about my family history, is Henri Matisse, um, the painter, who had some children, one of whom was Pierre, who's my grandfather. I grew up with this stuff all around me, um, and it was just an everyday part of our lives. We never talked about Henri. It was always sort of a great elephant in the room. There's a, a power behind it that, um, that certainly doesn't go away. And every time you walk through an exhibit, it always kind of leaves me speechless because what, what are you doing that wake when that's always behind you? There are times when it feels like the shadow that's cast by those figures is kind of too broad to ever get out from underneath. But nothing that I think putting your head down and getting to work won't resolve. And being here sort of pushed me forward to make the best work that I can make. It didn't really matter what my last name was because people started to recognize me for what I was doing. So this is the third and final day of the firing. It's good. Enough. Right now we're at top temperature in the front. The clay is mature. It's done. We're just building up ash deposits on the clay, building up the character of the clay body. Right now Josh is stoking, and the door's open, so the temperature's dropping. As he stokes, it'll take a minute. There's always a lag. And as it's catching, right in the beginning, the kiln will go into reduction, meaning there's too much fuel and not enough oxygen. But as that fuel starts to burn, then the temp we'll see the temperature start to go up as it is. And this kiln is very responsive. It also depends on the wood you're burning. This wood is mostly pine and poplar, and it's been drying for about three months, so it's really dry, it's ready to burn. So after a stoke in the front, you'll see a huge flame coming out of the chimney. Once that flame comes back into the chimney, then you know the atmosphere is kind of cleared up in there and the back is ready for a stoke. Are you ready? Are you ahead? Yep. It's important in the back because that's where all the glazed ware is. So it's important to get temperature so the glazes will melt. And I formulate my glazes to be a little stiffer because this kiln gets so hot and you need it to be really hot to get that, that temperature in the back. Every once in a while, towards the end of a firing, I'll pull out a cup, something small from the front. I'm never actually in love with the pots that I pull out because a lot happens from the time you stop firing to the time they come out of the kiln. What it does give me is a sense of how much ash and how much salt I have on the pots. This has a, a pretty thin chino on it, which has gotten a little darker in the reduction in the heat in the front that I would like a little more ash on this pot, so I'll probably just keep going for another hour or two. I had this sort of notion of wanting to go into the woods and come out and, and have this skill. And have something to, to offer the world. I wanted to create a place that would eventually have its own energy and attract other people. It is doing that. It is opening itself up. The evolution is very slow. You're not gonna hit a point one day and wake up and suddenly you're there, you've arrived. I have to work at it. 